He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 11, The Omega. Lois showed obvious disdain that Clark had canceled their lunch date, but as a consolation, she had gotten to see Wonder Woman in action. That was the name Lois had come up with for this radiant woman warrior, Wonder Woman. She was the most gorgeous, most ferocious being Lois had ever seen. Lois convinced Perry White to assign her to the story of the Amazonian woman pummeling a gargantuan beast into the sea. She wasn't the only one enamored. From the sound of Jimmy's rambling, he had also fallen in love. Lois isn't even exaggerating. That Wonder Woman was something else. I mean, I got so inspired, I went home and cleaned my whole apartment. Lois chuckled. Nice, Jimmy. I'm sure she'll be impressed. No, really. I mean, I don't expect her to come over or anything, but if anyone does come over, it looks really good right now. Lois teased, but Clark encouraged him. Wonder Woman had really sparked something inside of Jimmy Olsen. Good for you, Jimmy. She sounds pretty special. Lois took this segue to remind Clark that she was still upset at him. Well, Clark, I guess I should be thanking you for bailing on me for lunch, or I would have missed all this, sitting in some lame diner booth with you. Gee, Lois, uh, I guess you're welcome. Apology barely accepted. How about I make it up to you today? My treat. No thanks, Kent. I'm good. With a sharp pivot, she strutted away with a little extra sass in her step. Jimmy offered Clark a little consolation. I'll go with you to lunch, Clark. I'll even let you treat me. Thanks, Jimmy. But what are you doing afterward? Want to come along with me to Star Labs and do a little investigating? Oh boy, you know I do. At the diner, the two of them continued chatting about Wonder Woman. Clark was no less impressed by her, though he was a lot more quiet about it. He wanted to avoid bringing any unnecessary attention as to where he was during all of yesterday's commotion. After lunch, Clark and Jimmy went to Star Labs where they split up. Jimmy went to photograph the ruined East Wing, while Clark headed to the main desk to ask some questions. The staff at the reception desk were sad to inform Clark that their co-worker Rudy Jones had died in the accident. None of them knew Rudy's connection to the disaster. Clark chose to not even suggest there was one. When he learned all he could from them, he asked to speak to the Star Labs public relations spokesperson. While he waited, Clark telepathically communicated with Jean Jones. The two of them had coordinated a plan. While Jean snuck inside for clues, Clark kept the attention of the reception desk staff, asking the PR rep an endless stream of irrelevant questions. Was the creature part of an experiment? Who was overseeing its creation? How old was the creature? Clark's questions were just engaging and absurd enough so as to allow Jean Jones time to blend in as a janitor. When no one was looking, Jean phased through the wall and into Rudy's office to search for clues. Having returned to Metropolis, Jean Jones could assist with investigations with powers even Superman did not possess. While Jean had been gone, he had honed his powers as a detective, tracking down his former imprisoners and turning them into the authorities. Along his travels, he'd become known as the Martian Manhunter. Together, they had a chance to bring justice to the people that hurt Rudy Jones. Once Jean found his way inside Rudy's office, Clark went looking for Jimmy outside of the demolished East Wing. Jimmy was running his way when Clark found him along the lab's perimeter. Out of breath, Jimmy blurted, Clark! Ah, oh, jeez! Thank God it's you! Some thug tried to steal my camera just now! What? Where? By the wreckage, over there! Go back to the front desk and get a security guard, Jimmy. I'll go see if I can find the mugger. Ducking out of sight, Clark transformed into Superman and leapt to the demolished wing of the building in a single bound. Seeing it was totally abandoned, Clark realized the perpetrator was still likely after Jimmy and intent on stealing his camera. Leaping back into the air, Superman descended on his friend as he was struggling with the would-be thief. Together, they walked the man to be taken into custody by Star Lab security. No kidding, Superman! 
It's a good thing you showed up just now. Well, I was flying overhead when I saw you being robbed, so it was really no trouble at all. Anything particularly special about that camera that got the thief's interest? Well, it's not cheap, that's for sure. But I think he was more interested in the pictures I was taking. What do you mean? I don't know. Either he wanted them for himself or he didn't want me to have them. I'm not sure, maybe both. Clark worried he was now putting Jimmy in as much danger as he had put Lois. Just standing around talking to him as Superman might make him a target for Luther. He had to pretend to not know Jimmy. What's your name, son? Jimmy. Jimmy Olsen. Well, Jimmy, I'll tell you what. Just in case you need my help again, I'm going to give you a phone number. You can use it to message me on my communicator watch. Jimmy stood astonished. Like, for real, Superman? For real, Jimmy, but, you know, only for emergencies. Superman wrapped up the conversation with Jimmy and flew away after receiving a message from the Martian Manhunter. John Jones had slipped out already and had left the lab disguised in the form of a Star Labs employee. It didn't take Clark more than a few minutes to find Jimmy standing out front of Star Labs' main entrance. Aw oh man, Clark! You missed it! Superman was just here! Superman? Really? That was like the third time he saved me! He even gave me his emergency number! After seeing Jimmy safely back to the Daily Planet, Clark slipped off to meet with the Martian Manhunter. At Clark's apartment, the two of them looked over the laptop computer and small notepad that Jean had found in Rudy's office. Whether they contained any tangible evidence was unknown, but Jean was more concerned by what he had learned by reading the thoughts of the employees inside. They were trying to figure out where several missing materials had disappeared to. All of them were components in making nuclear weapons. It didn't help much that the notepad was full of miscellaneous notations and cryptic sets of numbers, all the while the computer was password protected. Jean Jones had a plan. I know someone we can trust who can access this. I can fly it to them. Clark agreed. You do that. I'm going to try to decipher this notepad. Actually, I thought I should also bring the notepad, in case they're related. It may contain the password. Clark conceded to let him take it. He didn't actually need the whole notepad. Most of the pages were filled with indecipherable numbers, but one page in particular had caught Clark's eye. It was one of Rudy's most recent notes, the directions to find a water taxi at the Fort Hob Pier. On the top of the page, underlined in all capital letters, it read, The Omega. That was all he needed to know. Clark let Jean take what clues they found in Rudy's office while he did some investigating of his own. Based on the clues in the notebook, Clark set out to the pier to ask the water taxi drivers there about the Omega. They didn't hesitate to point out the large gray yacht anchored not far offshore. When Clark showed them a picture of Rudy, a couple of them remembered taking him over to the yacht. They all agreed the Omega was unusual. One of the water taxi drivers explained, The yacht's only been in the harbor for a few weeks, but it's had a whole lot of traffic since it's been here. Clark thanked them for their help and gave them a little money for their troubles. They had been disappointed he didn't want a ride, but were all happy to receive a tip. It was mutual. Clark had learned all he needed. He soon returned, patrolling as Superman, high above and out of sight. Over the next few days, the boat received many visitors from the water taxis, including the delivery of several unusually large and oddly shaped packages. One day, the boat stopped coming to drop off or pick up anyone from the gray yacht. Clark took a break from patrol and went to do his job as a reporter. He was finishing an article on Star Labs and the lost nuclear materials while Lois seemed to linger around the office. She had finished up for the evening but kept finding things to do around her desk. When Clark began packing up for the night, Lois approached with a distinct glimmer in her eye. She had something on her mind. I'm ready to get lunch now. Oh? That's great, Lois. How about tomorrow at the diner? Well, I was thinking tonight, actually. Lunch? At this hour? Oh, come on, Clark. Don't be silly. I know there's something you want to talk about. Come over to my apartment. We'll have some drinks. Open up a little. Who knows? Clark was tempted to forget about watching the anchored yacht. He and Lois had much to discuss. Yet just as he was going to agree, they both received text notifications at the same time. It was an emergency announcement. A bomb was going to go off and everyone in Metropolis needed to take shelter. I guess lunch will be tomorrow after all. With no other words, he ran off and into the elevator. 
Lois wondered how he ever got anything done. The foolish man appeared to have taken the elevator up instead of down. From the Daily Planet rooftop, Clark flew to the Omega, concentrating his super hearing on the boat as he approached. The crew patrolling the boat spoke of their bomb's timer being set to go off and their willingness to sacrifice their lives. There weren't many of them left on the boat, but those that remained were willing to die for their cause. Superman could see into the yacht's bowels. The bomb was in the boat's innermost chamber. There was no time to risk diffusing it where it was. He dove into the water, under the yacht, and lifted into the air, flying it away, even further off than where Rudy Jones had made his last stand. When Clark felt he was safely away from the city, he set the Omega back down in the ocean. As Superman boarded the yacht, the few guards remaining on the ship met him with the lightest resistance of ineffective machine gun fire. Below deck, the inside of the boat was lit entirely in red. He made his way to the inner chamber, where he found the rest of the ship empty of people, but cluttered full of things. Odd materials and equipment filled the halls. When he found the room with the bomb, it was the most cluttered of them all. In the very center of the room, the bomb itself was mounted to the floor, illuminated by its own timer. Clark called out to Jean Jones with his mind. Jean, are you there? Yes, Kalem, I am. Is there any chance you can help instruct me in defusing a nuclear bomb before its timer goes off in a little under 20 minutes? There was a long pause before Jean Jones replied. I can try, but first, you are going to have to describe to me what it looks like. Superman described the bomb telepathically. As Jean Jones began instructing him, Superman opened the top panel of the casing, but instead of finding the inner workings of an explosive, Clark was staring at a large piece of kryptonite, mounted firmly to the faux bomb, not at all repelled by his belt. He instantly became lost in its green light, just inches from his face. This was the largest piece of kryptonite Clark had ever seen. Before he knew what was happening, his belt had been removed and a chain was being wrapped around him and fastened tight. It was John Corbin, Luther's henchman. Almost every link in the chain was solid kryptonite. Do you like it, Superman? I made it myself. This is why Lex hired me for this particular project. I have a special touch with carving stones. But what's wrong? You don't seem to like it. I've been working on it for months, just for you. Now, now, Corbin. Enough of your gloating. It's my turn. Luther had walked in at some point, but Clark hadn't noticed. Though it is some fine craftsmanship, isn't it, Superman? Oh, but I revile that wretched name. It is so juvenile. How dare you not tell me your name, Kryptonian? Through the fog of his overwhelming grief and guilt, Clark could just barely make out who was speaking to him. Clark strained to speak at all. Luther? Oh, please, call me Lex. We don't have much longer left to us in this world together. Let's not waste it on formalities. Corbin. Yes, sir. Find out where the crew has moved us to, and let me know when we've reached our destination. Yes, sir. Now, where was I? Ah, yes. Kryptonian. You thought you could play games with me, but I am not going to be toyed with by a Kryptonian. I may not be able to outright kill you, but I will drop you into the deepest trench in the sea if I must. Your kind have had your time. Ending you will be a service to humanity. Entranced by the green glow of kryptonite, Lex's words stung most of all because of how much they resonated as true. He felt guilty that his planet was dead because of his family, and that he, out of all of them, should be the one to survive. It seemed that Lex was right. Maybe by dying, he would bring peace to this world after all. Without Superman realizing it, Corbin had carried him onto the deck of the ship, and Lex was completing his diatribe of grievances. Curse you, Superman. Curse your father and your father's father. No matter how much pleasure I take from this, it will never be enough suffering to inflict on you. Without a second thought, Lex turned around and walked away. Corbin, meet me in the helicopter. And though John Corbin was sure nothing he could add would dig as deep as Lex already had, he felt he owed it to himself to come up with something to say, being the one to actually kill Superman. As he hoisted him over the railing of the boat, before dropping Superman into the sea, the best Corbin could come up with was, Say hello to the fish for me. Clark never felt the splash of the water. 
He couldn't say when it was he began to sink. It felt to Clark as though he had already been sinking forever, well before he was thrown overboard. Once submerged, the sinking became everything. Time dilated, and the moment became eternal, taking him deeper into his darkest fears. Clark felt unworthy of the task set before him. He could not fix this problem his family had created. He was the problem. The darkness consuming him was where he belonged. He accepted his fate, eternally falling into the depths, an eternity unexpectedly punctuated by touching down on the bottom of the ocean floor. Without the actual physical sensation of descending, Clark became further disoriented. He entered an eternity of laying in the darkness only lit by the soft glow of kryptonite, forever reminding him of his lost home. Clark had abandoned hope, but he thought he saw a light. A glow approached him as it descended from above. It was even more kryptonite, released from the ship to bury him in his grave. Clark was overtaken by the horror of his fate. This could not be. Surely, this weight coming down on him was not all his own. Before it could swallow him entirely, he cried out in anguish, like he had never let himself before. His remorse for Krypton rang out through the sea as Clark was swallowed by the jetsam of kryptonite. His whole world was kryptonite, the pain and weight of his ancestors crushing down on him. It would have been a living grave had his cry gone unheard. Instead, a hand reached through the rubble. A man surrounded in a golden light pulled Clark free. As his delirium began to subside, he was greeted by a warm smile. To Clark's amazement, the man broke through the kryptonite chains as though they were nothing. He then slung Clark's arm over his shoulder and carried him, swimming through the water in the same manner Clark flew through the air. Ashore on the rocky coast, Clark sputtered out water, gasping for air. He didn't know if it was possible for him to drown, but he had never lost all air before. His savior quietly stood by, giving Clark as much time as he needed to recover. Superman sat slumped on the rocks, his radiance dimmed. In sharp contrast, this young man who had saved him stood ablaze with a golden light, shirtless, with a bronze tan and matching hair. On the ocean floor, just moments earlier, Clark had thought he deserved his plight, but having escaped it, he was nothing but grateful. Thank you. The young man's response was strikingly casual. Yo, no problem. No, really, I appreciate it. Don't even trip, cousin. I got you. That's what family's for. Excuse me? At least that's what my mom says. I tell her about this stuff I read. You know, keep her up to date on the surface news. Clark sat up to attention. Hold on. Did I miss something? Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I should have introduced myself. He fist bumped Superman and said, Arthur Curry. Clark Kent. Good to meet you. But what do you mean by surface news? Oh, you know, I'm only half Atlantean. My pops is human. Atlantean? Like from Atlantis. Oh, yeah. Like, did no one tell you this stuff growing up? No. I grew up in the prairie, with two human parents. Arthur scratched his head, one hand on his hip. Huh. But you come from Krypton, right? Clark slowly slumped over again, thinking of his home planet. Yeah, that's right. Arthur rubbed his chin in contemplation. I don't know if I'm the best dude for explaining this kind of stuff. Well, I don't know what to tell you. No one else brought it up. Fair point. Let me see what I can do. Okay, so, you knew Anki, right? Well, yeah, but not personally. You don't? Dude, how old are you? I thought you guys aged super slow up there. I got here as a baby and have aged pretty normally ever since. Huh. Weird. Well, anyway, Anki, he was like, basically the water master, and like, he was tired of his brother destroying the humans he created. So, since he was like, the water master, he made us so we could live under the sea. That way Enlo wouldn't be so gnarly on us. So, you're telling me there really is a city of Atlantis? Well, it's a lot bigger than a city. It's got like, lots of cities. They're just kind of in another dimension. It's really hard to explain, but there's like, basically, mostly, no way to slip between dimensions. At least, like, whenever Krypton isn't nearby. What's that supposed to mean? Well, like I said, I'm half human, half Atlantean. So like, 
There was no way my mom and dad would have actually met, let alone, like, even touch each other if Krypton didn't come close to Earth first. But it totally did before it totally got destroyed. So that's totally how my mom met my dad. Trust me, cousin, this stuff is weird. But I'm just telling it to you like they told to me. Like, are you gonna be okay? You don't seem so hot at the moment, my dude. I'll be alright. I just need to recover from the kryptonite. Yeah, what happened back there? I thought you were super powerful. Not when I'm around kryptonite. I just, when I'm around it, I think of Krypton, and I, I don't know. It's cool, my dude. I get it. We have a messed up family. I'm not even going to get into what I'm going through back at home. But like I said, I got your back. Thanks. And I don't mean to sound rude. But do you really think you can help me redeem our family to humanity? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, I don't know. Your grandfather killed my grandfather. And you and I are doing okay, right? Yeah. I guess so. And that, my cousin, is progress. So like, do you need me to carry you home or something? Clark stood up and the winds began to lightly stir around him once more. I think I'll manage. Thank you, Arthur. You really pulled me out of the worst of it. You can thank the fish. They relayed the message. The cousins said their goodbyes. Arthur dove into the sea, and Clark flew back to Metropolis, letting Jean know he was all right along the way. Heading straight to Star Labs, Clark hoped it was still possible for Dr. Hamilton to observe the effects the kryptonite had had on him. Thankfully, while he was there, Superman managed to get another belt to replace the one he lost. The doctor also gave him a new watch after his broke on the ocean floor. Late that evening, when Clark returned to the Daily Planet and saw Lois still working by herself, he remembered their vague lunch plans for that day and the abrupt end to their last conversation. Uh... Hi, Lois. She kept working without responding, as though he wasn't there. When she finished what she was doing and began packing her things, Clark tried again. Look, I'm really sorry about today. What? What about today? Why would you be sorry? Oh, uh, I thought we had plans to get lunch today. Oh, did we? I hadn't noticed. I was too busy eating lunch by myself. After having spent the night wondering if I should be in a bomb shelter, after my ex-boyfriend abandoned me when we each got the same emergency warning, instead of comforting me in a time of crisis, like he should have if he were a half-decent guy not consumed in his own moping. So yeah, I'm fine. I'm doing great. And I'm so happy to see you, Clark. And if you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. Lois, I'm Superman. Oh, good one, Clark. You've decided to wait until now to try sarcasm, too. Really great. No, Lois, I'm... I mean, I really am Superman. That's why I had to go last night. That's why I'm always busy. And that's why I didn't comfort you. Because I don't know how to tell you this. I don't know how to share this part of my life. I don't want you to be hurt because of me. I keep meaning to tell you, but I keep missing our lunch dates. Lois's eyes widened. You were gonna tell me this at the diner? You thought that was the place to break a bombshell like this? Well, I... I thought it was the best place, since you haven't seemed to want to talk to me. Well, I haven't, but... Well, in light of all this, now I'm thinking I might have judged you a little harshly. You have saved me on multiple occasions, and... Oh my god. Lois's shoulders tightened. She crossed her arms and began holding her elbows. I've kissed both of you. I'm so embarrassed. She kind of just stared blankly for a moment. Clark stepped closer to comfort her. She stepped back and put a hand up in between them. Hold on. Was I in danger all of those times because they thought I knew you? But they only thought I knew you because you kept saving me? Basically, yes. But you make a fair share of risky choices, so it's hard to say when the cycle began. I was hoping distancing ourselves would make you safer. Wow, that's messed up. I guess I should be thanking you for being such a pathetic boyfriend. Uh, you're welcome? Honestly, I still kind of don't believe you. You are way too much of a dweeb to be Superman. I mean, like, have you met him? Clark stood there, letting the absurdity of her question set in. Do you want me to prove it to you? 
How do you mean? Grab your things. Let's go to the roof. Lois got her coat and purse and they headed up to the top of the Daily Planet. In a blink, Clark transformed into Superman. His light washed over Lois as she outwardly relaxed. He then swooped her into his arms and flew her home. They landed on her balcony, and while still embraced in his arms, she gazed up at him. Okay. I believe you now. Superman leaned in to kiss her, but Lois put her hand up to stop him and stepped away. I can't. I have a boyfriend. This was bewildering news to Clark. Lois slowly stepped backwards. Good night, Clark. She spun away and went inside her apartment. Clark turned around and flew back to the Daily Planet to finish his writing. He supposed it was for the best that Lois had not kissed him, but it bothered him that she was okay with it before. At least, the truth was finally told. Arriving home at the end of a very long day, Clark got a full night's sleep for a change. His dreams were of Krypton and Earth, yet this time, he did not awaken when Enlo killed Enki. Instead, his dreams blended in with the next dream of rolling seas and golden light. Clark remembered none of these visions by the time he woke up, but the sensation stayed with him. He had found a new sense of peace. Something had changed inside of himself. Clark didn't yet realize it, but after telling Lois his secret, his whole life would be transformed. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Son of Ella is written and produced by myself. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC Comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peterson, Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, John Ostrander, Joe Brzezowski, Marv Wolfman, Jerry Ordway, Robert Bernstein, Al Plastino, Mort Weisinger, and Paul Norris. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Loyalty Freak Music, Leisure B, Blue Dot Sessions, Kylo Kaz, Kyle Preston, Tortu Supersonic, Barbarics, Bio Unit, Oscar Schuster, and Posimist. See the episode notes for details. If you're enjoying this audiobook, please recommend it to friends and write a review. I deeply appreciate it. Another way to show your support is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. There are no ways to lose these games, and yet the struggle is real. And be sure to listen to the next episode. Chapter 12. Power Couple.